The prayer offered in faith will restore the one who is sick and the Lord will raise him up and if he has committed sins, they will be forgiven him. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another so that you will be healed. The effectual prayer of a righteous man can accomplish much. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the earth for three and years and six months. Then he prayed again, and the sky poured rain, and the earth produced its fruit. And now, Father, grab us with this theme of contacting heaven through prayer. Forgive our prayerlessness and cause us to see why this matters. And we will give you the praise for meeting us this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. Before a major sporting event, they will often play the national anthem. Now, the national anthem has absolutely nothing to do with what's getting ready to happen on the field. It doesn't affect the football game. It doesn't affect the baseball game. It doesn't affect points scored in the basketball game. But it is put there as a place of national honor, but totally unrelated to what you came there for. You don't go there for the national anthem. That's an add-on. For many of us, prayer is like the national anthem before a sporting event. It gets it started, but has absolutely no connection to what's happening in our lives. We do it because it's tradition. We're supposed to. It's paying homage while being totally disconnected from the field of play of our lives. And yet, it is one of the dominant themes of Scripture. And as you saw when I read each verse in this passage, it is the dominant theme of James. In verses 13 through 18, you see the word pray or prayer in every verse. So for James, this is a big deal. I hope to explain to us today why. God has a conditional will and an unconditional will. God's will is what he determines to happen. But it can happen in one of two ways. It can happen unconditionally or conditionally. God's unconditional will is when he determines what will happen irrespective of what anybody else does. That is, it's not conditioned on us or anybody else because he's going to decide that it happens and he's going to cause it to happen without any human involvement. That is his unconditional will. It's not conditioned on our actions or non-actions because he's the sovereign, he sovereignly decided to make it come to pass all by himself. That is his unconditional will. But God's conditional will is different. There are many things he's decided to not let happen until he gets cooperation from earth. There are many things that he's decided he will not bring from heaven into history unless there is human cooperation with his desire and design. For example, the Bible says God desires all men to be saved. Yet men only get saved when they believe on the Lord Jesus Christ for salvation. 
So he has a will, but it's tied to a condition. Many things in your life and my life are tied to God's conditional will. So things happen or don't happen based not on God's decision, but on our cooperation or lack thereof. One of the primary mechanisms that God has established to determine much of what he does on earth and in your life and in my life is conditioned by the absence or presence of prayer. James says in chapter 1 verses 1 chapter 4 verses 1 to 3 you have not because you ask not. Or when you ask, you ask with wrong motives. He says, I wanted to give it to you, but you never came to me for it, so you don't have it. It wasn't because I didn't want to give it. It was because you didn't cooperate with getting it because it was part of my conditional will. Prayer is relational communication with God. And the goal of prayer is to draw from heaven into history. The goal of prayer is to get eternity to make a statement in time. It is to make heaven visible on earth. It is to get God to touch humanity. The goal of prayer is that up there might do something, fix something, or change something down here. When God makes a big deal about prayer, which he does throughout all of scripture, we are asking God to release his will from heaven to earth. We're giving him an okay because we're cooperating, because it is part of his conditional will. Now, the problem is you don't always know what's conditional and what's unconditional. Some things are clear, but other things you're not sure. That's why Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 5, 17, you better pray without ceasing. You better bring it all to God so you don't miss nothing. Because all the time it's not clear which way God is operating from. In the mind of the Bible, prayer is a lifestyle and not merely an event. If I were to say to you, breathe without ceasing, <laughs> you would understand what I meant because if you cease breathing, you'd cease. So if I said breathe without ceasing, you know that's just got to be how you roll. That's got to be how you roll. So when Paul says pray without ceasing, he's talking about this is how you roll. This is how you roll, that it is a lifestyle, not merely an event. When you go into another country, they're going to ask you to show a passport. The passport gives you permission to go into this new realm, this new locality, this new country. It is permission. God has given every believer a toll-free number. You got an 800 number. It's toll-free. And it is designed to give you permission to leave earth and enter the sphere of heaven through the mechanism of prayer. So prayer is not just saying some word, it's changing locations. When you pray, as we will describe in a moment, you leave the physical and you have now entered the spiritual. Without prayer, you become limited to the physical. But the only reason you pray is to get the spiritual God to enter into the physical. The passport to leave the physical and enter the spiritual is in one word in scripture, and that word is prayer. Now, let me explain. Prayer does not get God to do something he doesn't want to do because you can't make God do something. But what prayer does is access what he already wants to do. 
that he has conditioned on your participation and mine. I love Isaiah 65 verse 24. Isaiah 65, 24 says, before you call, I have answered. Oh, did you follow that? Before you prayed, I have already answered the prayer. So you are not praying to get God to do something, but to pull down something he's already predetermined to do. Because if he's already done it before you ask for it, then why don't I have it? Because it has to be pulled down, pulled from heaven into history, and that is done through prayer. This concept of prayer is distributing eternity into time. You remember when the disciples were asked by Jesus, how are we going to feed 5,000 men, not counting women and children, 15 to 20,000 people? And they said, we don't know. But they found a little boy with two fish, five barley loaves of bread. They brought him to Jesus because there's a problem. How are we going to feed all these people? The Bible says Jesus looked up to heaven and he prayed. And he invited God into the problem. When everybody opened up their eyes, Moby Dick is laying on the beach. Or could have killed a whale. Somehow, there was supernatural provision so that the scripture says everybody ate till, the, till they were full and there were 12 baskets filled, lay, uh, ba 12 baskets filled with uh, leftovers for them. And the disciples distributed the food to all that were gathered. Jesus Christ got heaven to enter history, but he prayed for that to take place, which answered the problem, and all men did was distribute what the supernatural had provided. So help me out. If Jesus had to pray to get his heavenly father to do something up there to change something down here, how much do you and I need to pray to get God to do something up there that we need him to do down here? So we're talking about something serious. We're talking about drawing heaven into history. So let's break down this passage. And by the end of this passage, I hope you have, will have been ignited for a new fire regarding prayer and its power to take the kingdom of heaven and invade the kingdom of earth through the mechanism of prayer. Verse 13, is anyone among you suffering? Suffering meant to be going through a difficult period of time. Suffering means you are hurting. Something is hurting you. It could be physical hurt, financial hurt, circumstantial hurt, relational hurt. All you know is you're in pain. You are suffering. So just to make sure I'm not wasting my time here, let me ask you what James asked his audience. Is there anybody here this morning suffering? Yeah. Let me raise your hand. You're suffering? All right. Good. I want to make sure we, we could apply this. So for everybody who raised their hands, for those who are lying and didn't raise their hands, <laughs> and for those who will need to raise their hand tomorrow, even though they may not need to raise it today, is any among you suffering? You're going through a rough patch of life. He says, notice this, he must pray. Not he should pray, not it would be nice if he did pray. He says, you better pray. If life has fallen on you, many of these Christians were being persecuted. Many were going through trials that were difficult to, to handle and they were hurting. James says, if you are hurting, 
because of circumstances, you must pray. Pain is always an invitation to prayer. Pain, in whatever form it takes, is always an invitation to pray. You say, well, I'm hurting all the time. That means you should be praying all the time because pain is an invitation to pray. In fact, one of the reasons God lets pain linger is to get more prayer from us. So we actually can lengthen pain time or shorten pain time by lengthening prayer time and not shortening prayer time. If anyone is hurting, he not should, not could, he must make contact with heaven in the midst of the pain. He must pray. He goes on in verse 13. Notice what he says. Is anyone cheerful? He is to sing praises. So now we're not talking about the person in pain. We're talking about all them folk that didn't raise their hand. That should mean you're cheerful. It's a good day. You're happy today. You're not in any uh, excruciating difficulty right now. He says, well, if your day is going well, you're cheerful. Let him sing praises. Now, a praise is a expression of value to the Lord. It is honoring the Lord physically and verbally. There's no such thing as silent praise. You can have silent worship, but you can't have silent praise. Praise is always visual and vocal. That's why he says sing praises to the Lord. Wait a minute. Let's rewind. If you're in pain, pray. If you're not in pain, you're not sad but you're glad, praise. Well, hold it. You're either one or the other. You're either in pain or you're cheerful. If you're in pain, talk to God. If you're not in pain, praise God. Which means that you're always communicating with God because you're either in pain or in praise. So God wants to hear from you all day, nonstop, as a way of life. He wants you to thread him into every aspect of your day, either in pray, prayer or in praise. Because you're either in pain or you're in praise. What does that mean? That means you got a 24-7 thing going on with God. That's why you can't get mad at your grandmother when she's walking around as a state. They go, I'm going to praise the Lord, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Yeah. Yeah. Because God wants a connection ongoingly in every aspect of our lives, whether we're hurting or not. Verse 14. He says, is anyone among you sick? Sick. Now the Greek word for sick means to be weary. That's what the word means. It means to be weary. The idea of sickness here is not merely physical sickness. It could be physical. But the word refers to its effect. It's created weariness. It's like when you say, I'm sick and tired. Or when you look at the person next to you and you say, I'm sick of you. <laughs> All right? That's a form of sickness. That means you are tired of them. I'm sick of this job. You know? I'm sick of this circumstance. You're expressing a weariness, but you're using the word sick. Okay? You may not mean you. You're not saying, I'm sick of you, I'm physically sick. It means I'm tired of dealing with you. I am weary. So the concept of sick 
which could be physical or emotional or circumstantial, has to do with I've been beat down, broke down, toe up from the flow up because life, the weight of life. And I'm just tired. I'm tired. I've been going through this for this long. I've been struggling with this. I am just weary. I'm sick and tired. So let me make sure I'm being relevant here. Anybody weary? All right. I just want to make sure we're relevant. So he's speaking now. There's the sufferer. That's the person that's going through pain. But this is the weary one. The one who because of what they may be suffering is not sure they can go on any further. Not sure they can make it. Want to throw in the towel. What happens when you get weary, no matter what's caused the weariness? Then let him call on the elders of the church and they are to pray over him. Ah. Oh. In verse 13, you are praying for you. Anyone suffering, let him pray. But in verse 14, you need help. Because your prayers are not getting through. In fact, you don't even feel like praying anymore. When life beats you down long enough, deep enough, you can get tired of dealing with God. Now that doesn't sound spiritual, but all of y'all know that's true. You don't feel like talking to God right now. God seems absent from you. The telephone line is off the hook. It's busy. You're not breaking through. You're just mumbling the same words over and over again. You, you feel like you're talking to yourself. He says, okay, now at that point that you hit weariness, you need more than you. So he says, go to the elders of the church. That should represent the spiritual leadership of the church to get support for a breakthrough you have not been able to get on your own. Every Sunday morning, before each of the services, the elders meet. And on a regular basis, we are praying for some member that has called to speak about their situation, their weariness, or their suffering. And so we schedule them for a time of prayer before the service that they come to. We had a prayer today from a sister who's here this morning. And the one word that was used in our time of prayer was, I'm tired. I'm tired. That's this word. That's this situation. Nothing is happening. God hasn't changed anything yet. And I'm just tired. Will you pray for me? This is when people want to give up, throw in the towel. That means you need some other folk who can cry out for you because you are too tired to cry out for yourself. He says, you go call the elders of the church and let them pray because you may not be able to. That's why you are to be a part of a local church so that when you can't go on, somebody else can keep you going on. You're not to be a lone ranger Christian. So that must be Spiritual people, since they represent the church, is talking about the environment. People who can carry you when you can't carry yourself. Reminds me of the story in Mark chapter 2, verses 1 to 12. You got a lame man, a paralyzed man. He can't get up. He can't get up. He'd been laying there a long time and he can't get up. But he had four boys. He had four posse. For his homies, they came and it says, and they picked him up and took him to the house where Jesus was. It says they cut a hole in the roof and let him down in front of Jesus. And then it says, when Jesus saw their faith, not the man's faith who was laying down, when he saw his homies faith, when he saw the four brothers who picked him up, when he saw their faith, he healed the man. The man couldn't get up on his own, 
but he had some folk in his life who cared enough about him to reach over, pick him up, lift him up, carry him to Jesus, drop him down, and when Jesus saw the four men, he said, I'm gonna heal you for their sake because you can't get up on your own. I wish I could come in and tell you this morning, if you are a committed Christian, you won't get tired. Oh, but some of God's most tired Christians were committed Christians. Paul said he was ready to give up on life in 2 Corinthians chapter 1. He was ready to throw in the towel until God lifted him up. So just believing in Christ and being a Christian doesn't mean you don't suffer, and it certainly means you don't get weary. But God does not want you to deal with your weariness alone. He says, let them pray. He goes on and he says, and then let them anoint him with oil. Let them anoint him with oil. Oil had um, a number of usages in the Bible, as it does today. Oil was used medicinally. It was a medication. If you got cut, you would anoint, put oil anointment on, like we do in a more sophisticated way today. Uh, when you go to a massage, you get a massage, they put all these oils on you to refresh you, to, to kind of uh, make you feel good, and they try to get you to relax, so oil is used for that. Oil is used for cooking. You cook with oil. So all of these uses of oil are in the Bible. Sometimes it's not even referring to physical oil. In Psalm 23, verse 5, David says, he anoints my head with oil. Well, God didn't come down and massage David's head with oil. He's talking about the refreshing and the encouragement and the stimulation he got from God when he was facing a bad situation. So oil has all these multiplicity of usages in the Bible. He says, when that member comes to the elders, you are to pray for them, but then anoint them. In other words, have the church minister to them at the point of their need. Pour oil on them. We have members who have driven people to the hospital who couldn't go themselves. So they prayed for them, but then they opened their car door and drove them to the oil of healing by getting them to a doctor. Then we have people who gather with people who are hurting to provide counsel and comfort. Or we have a group when somebody loses someone in care and comfort to encourage them through their loss of a loved one. All of those are biblical ways of expressing oil or the comfort or the help or the refreshment of ministry. That's why your being in a local church is not just for you. It's you to also be an oil provider for somebody who needs some oil on them. Somebody who needs some encouragement, refreshment, or assistance. Everybody here ought to be helping somebody sometime due to the fact that they have become weary because one day you're going to need somebody to get some oil on you when life has fallen through for you. So it is absolutely critical, he says, let the elders make sure that there is ministry going to the people. The church is not just a sermon. It's not just a song. It's supposed to be a place of ministry. Where That's why we ask every member to be in a ministry. So you are serving and not just being served. Because you are to be an oil provider. Whatever, whether it's physical or emotional or circumstantial. So he says, when you can't handle it yourself, come to the church, call on the elders, get the ministry, the oil. And you do it, he says, in the name of the Lord. Why? Because we're talking about kingdom prayer. We're talking about authority from heaven. The name means according to the character, the attributes, and the authority of Jesus Christ. You do it in Jesus' name because he's the one who okays the answers to prayer. Verse 15. And the prayer offered in faith will restore the one who is sick. 
Mm. The prayer offered in faith, here's a word, I love this word, we need this word, restores. Mm. Restores. To restore something is to bring it back to its original intent. When something breaks, you restore it. You, 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 you try to bring it back to its original intent. God is a restoring God. In the wearinesses of life, he makes an astounding promise. He says, God will restore. Now, let me clarify. We know that everybody who gets physically sick don't always get well. Or they may get partially well, or they may be just a little better. We, we know that perfect health is not always restored in every situation. We know it is sometimes, but it's not all the time. We also know in the Bible, people got sick who were in the will of God. Job was in the will of God when he got sick. All physical sickness is not due to personal sin. When you catch a cold, it doesn't mean you just sinned. Now it might, but it doesn't necessarily mean that. Yes, we have an environment that's been affected by sin, but all sickness is not due to personal sin. That's why often disillusionment sets in when pulpits make promises that God does not make. Because then it looks like God has failed. The word sick is weary. What God does when you can't lift yourself up while you are praying for a change in the circumstance is he removes the weary while you wait. It has to do, yes, sometimes God takes you out, but other times he walks with you through. Other times he, he walks beside you. He restores you emotionally, even though you're waiting for him to restore you circumstantially or physically. Sometimes he does both. But the restore here is to remove the weariness while you still trust him for the solution. He says in that he can guarantee you. He's guaranteeing that one. He will restore. He will get your get up and go that has gotten up and gone back. He says the prayer of faith that believes God, that acts like God is telling the truth. It reminds me of the story of these folks who were praying for rain. They were praying for rain because it was dry. They were praying for rain. It, and it didn't rain. They went out praying for rain. Didn't rain. Didn't rain. So they're disappointed at God. A little boy came out a few days later by himself in the center of town. He praying for rain. God, you control the heavens, and I believe you can make it rain. He just stood there. God, I know you can make it rain. All of a sudden, the sky got cloudy. A little bit later, it started raining. All these adults were praying for rain. No rain. This little boy comes for praying for rain. It rained. What was the difference between all the adults and the little boy? The little boy brought an umbrella. See, the little boy wasn't just talking. He was expecting. He was expecting. See, when the prayer of faith is a prayer that acts like you believe God can do something. It's not just talking in air. It's, it knows who you're talking to, and you know what his ability is to pull off what you ask for. And whatever is the appropriate thing to do because you believe you're willing to do. He says, the prayer of faith will heal the sick. It will remove the weariness. 
and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, because maybe he didn't, but if he has, they will be forgiven him. Why do we pray for one another? That our circumstances change, and if necessary, that sin get addressed. Because sin can keep you sick. All, sin is not, all sickness is not due to sin, but sickness can be caused by sin. 1 Corinthians 11 makes it clear, many are sick, many are weak among you. Why? Because of unaddressed sin. So the reason why you need to be in fellowship with some people who are spiritual is so that they can help you face sin so that you can get over sick. Because if you're unwilling to deal with sin, you will have to stay sick or weary or defeated or whatever it is because you're not willing to address the sin. You're not willing to repent. But he says, if you will deal with it spiritually, your sin is forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to one another. He says in verse 16, acknowledge the sin that's created the weariness for which you need to repent to the appropriate other. Now, how do you know who the appropriate other is? Because some people you can't tell your stuff to. Okay? It'd be all over town. Okay? How do you know who the other is when you need help out of weariness and you need victory over sin, but you need another? Who is the other? It can't just be any and everybody. He actually tells you. He says, confess to one another, and then he says, and pray for one another. So you only confess to somebody who's going to pray for you, not talk about you. If they're not a prayer, you shouldn't be a confessor. Okay? If they're not a prayer, if they're not somebody who's going to wrap themselves around you, come alongside of you, pray for you, walk with you spiritually, all they want is gossip news and information that's not who you talk to you talk to prayers because this is about prayer this is about getting you to heaven not just trying to throw stuff up on earth so the confess to is the pray for he says that you may be healed that you may be delivered from or through whatever is taking place in your life. The word, if he has committed in the Greek is the perfect tense. The perfect tense means past action with abiding results. So what that means is, if he has committed a sin that he keeps on committing. In other words, this is a habit of sin that they haven't broken. It's a pattern. They started and they weren't able to stop. So they need to be delivered, healed, delivered from this. So you, you, you get help from folk who are going to pray and get to God with you and for you. Now he makes a summary statement. Stay with me here in verse 17. Uh, it's verse 16. The effective prayer of a righteous man can accomplish much. The effective, the word there means energize. Remember to energize a bunny? The energized prayer. So this is not, Lord, bless this food to my body, nourish it to me, in Jesus' name, amen. He's not talking about grace. Because you don't need energy to say grace. You say grace out of habit. In fact, we've said the same grace so long, your mind doesn't even need to be in gear when your mouth is saying it. Because it's going to be the same words. Lord, thank you for this food I'm about to receive. Nourish you to my body. In Jesus' name, amen. Bam. That's not an energized prayer. 
In fact, when we pray that prayer, we don't even care whether God is listening. We want to get to the food before it gets cold. That's not an energized prayer. An energized prayer is a focused prayer. It is a prayer that is God-centered. It must be accompanied by righteousness, the effective prayer of a righteous man, a person who is living to please God. Nobody is perfect, but you can be righteous. That is, you're living to please God. The effective, focused, energized prayer can accomplish much, a whole lot. I remember some years ago, we had the daughter of one of our members dying of cancer. Things looked hopeless. Pastor Hawkins and I went to the hospital. I'll never forget this. We, we went to the hospital and we have grieving parents and a hopeless situation. And we, were, we went there to pray. I mean, it was hopeless. And I'll never forget what we did. We were working all day here at the office. We were dressed in suit and tie. We got in the car together. We drove to the hospital. When we looked at the child, when we saw the desperate situation, he and I both did this. We unbuttoned our jackets and took off our coat. We unhooked our tie and took our tie off. We opened up the top button of our shirts and we got on the floor. Because this was not, this, this isn't, now I lay me down to sleep. Pray the Lord my soul will keep. If I die before I wake, pray the Lord my soul will take. No, we needed some effective. We needed, we, this was a desperate situation. Now, I'll never forget it. We took all, all of our stuff, got down on the floor and said, God, we need you to come down now and intervene in this situation. Why? Because this is a serious suffering, a serious sickness, and this is not regular business as usual. And through some supernatural means, things got turned in that girl's life and the cancer dissipated. Now that wasn't because we had something special. All we did was we went to God serious. Our minds, hearts, focus was in gear. He says that prayer can do, can, can, can blow your mind. It can accomplish much, not a little bit, a whole lot. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man, he says, can accomplish much. And then he gives an illustration. So stick with me because this is a doozy. He says in verse 17 and 18, Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. Translation, he wasn't from Krypton. Okay? He wasn't super prophet. He was a regular, ordinary, flesh and blood individual. He didn't have any unique thing over any other human being ever made. He was a man with a like nature. So whatever he's getting ready to say about Elijah is true about you. Because he's just like you. He's just a man. That's all he is, he's saying. However, this ordinary man who was a prophet. It says, he prayed, notice the word, earnestly. He wasn't being casual. He prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the earth for three years and six months. That's three and a half years. Then he prayed again, verse 17 says, and the sky poured rain and the earth produced its fruit. So watch this now. He prayed and he closed heaven down for three and a half years. He's on earth, but he praying to heaven and he shut heaven down when it came to rain. Three and a half years later, he prayed again and he opened heaven up. Heaven didn't just close and open on its own. It says he prayed and it closed. He prayed and it opened. Ah, oh. 
So let's go back and see what really happened in 1 Kings chapter 18 because that's where this event took place. So if you turn your Bibles back to 1 Kings chapter 18, we're going to discover some things about his prayer that should affect our prayer so that we see a lot more of heaven entering into our history than we are currently seeing as believers. In chapter 18, he prays beginning in verse 36, but then he comes to verse 41. And Elijah said to Ahab, go up, eat and drink, for there is the sound of the roar of a heavy shower. He says, I hear a thunderstorm coming on. Now, let me start. Stay with me. Why did he pray this? I mean, what made him pray this in the first place? Well, look at chapter 17, verse 1. Now, Elijah the Tishbite, who was of the settlers of Gilead, said to Ahab, As the Lord, the God of Israel, lives before whom I stand, surely there shall be neither dew nor rain these years except at my word. Oh, now read chapter 18, verse 1. Now it happened after many days that the word of the Lord came to Elijah in the third year saying, go show yourself to Ahab and I will send rain on the face of the earth. Oh, in chapter 17, verse 1, God said it's not going to rain. In chapter 18, verse 1, God said it is going to rain. So why do you need to know that? Because Elijah didn't just make this up. He was praying based on what God had said. God said it's not going to rain. God said it is going to rain. So he prayed, watch this, based on God's word. So the first thing you need to know is you need to pray with your Bible open. You need to pray, say, God, you said this. Let me show you in case you forgot. God, you said this, and I'm holding you to your word. You said this. I believe this. So I'm going to pray this. The Bible is full of prayers that you should pray when you're struggling. That's Psalm 42. You pray Psalm 42. When you're repentant, that's Psalm 51. You pray Psalm 51. When you are afraid, that's Psalm 34. You pray Psalm 34. You point God back to his word because God has held his word high above his name. So you start with the word of God about the situation that you faced. All right, let's go on. He goes on to say, I hear the sound, I hear the sound, there's a storm coming on. Verse 42, and Ahab went up to eat and drink, but Elijah went up to the top of Mount Carmel and crouched down on the earth. Somebody say crouch down. Crouch down on the earth and put his face between his knees. Oh, okay, all right. He goes up to Mount Carmel and it says he crouched down, put his head between his knees. You didn't see that. See, he went up to Mount Carmel. He crouched down and he put his head between his knees. One more time. He went up to Mount Carmel. He crouched down and he put his head between his knees. What's the crouching down and the head between your knees all about? Well, in biblical days, when women were having babies, they didn't have stirrups. They didn't have the sophistication. So a normal way for a Jewish woman to have a baby was to crouch down, put her head down, and push, and push, and push, and push until that baby came out. So he took the posture of a pregnant woman who was in labor. The Bible calls it travail. He was in labor, and he said, I need some rain. I want some rain. I'm going to push, and push, and push till I get some rain. Oh, you know what God wants you to do? He wants you to birth his will from heaven in history by calling it down, drawing it down, pushing it down until that baby of deliverance, that baby of healing, that baby of victory comes forth. This is serious praying. This is not casual praying. This is crying out. Why? Why do I have to work so hard? Because Satan is trying to block your prayer from getting through. He's putting static on the line. Already up there, if you have direct TV, they already have the programs. 
The programs are already out there. News shows, movies, entertainment shows, comedy shows, music. It's already out there. But until that receiver is turned on, you won't see a picture on your screen. God has already got out there what he plans to do. But until the receiver calls it down, you don't see a picture on your screen. Oh, but I'm not finished yet. Because look at what it says. It says, he said to his servant, go now, look toward the sea. So he went and looked and said, there is nothing. He said, servant, go to the sea and look for the storm. Servant went out and said, oh, uh, uh, Elijah, there's no storm out here. But wait a minute. We just read Elijah heard the sound of a storm. But the servant went out and he didn't see a storm. See, that's why you got to be in touch with God. So you hear stuff before you see stuff. Because faith is not what you see. Faith comes, faith is what you don't see. But if you can hear the voice of the Holy Spirit, if you can hear the voice of God, you can hear stuff before you see stuff. Because somebody here can testify, God told me before I saw it. So he told his servant, he told his servant to go back seven times. He says, I want you to go back seven times in verse 43. Why seven? Because seven in the Bible is the number of completion. Whenever you see the word seven, it means something has been brought to completion. Sometimes people say, how long should I pray for something? How long should I talk to God? I've been praying about this for years and nothing has happened. How long should I pray? Well, let me explain something. God only has three answers. Yes, no, or wait. If he hadn't said yes and he hadn't said no, that means wait. So what you do while you wait, you pray till you get a yes or a no. You pray to completion. When he went out the seventh time, he said, I saw a cloud coming out of the sea like the size of a man's fist. You know how small a cloud that is? He said, I just saw a little cloud. I don't see a storm. I just see a little fist-sized cloud. Elijah said, he said after the seventh time and he saw the cloud, Ahab, prepare your chariot, verse 44, and go down so the heavy shower does not stop you. He didn't let him see a shower. He let him see a cloud. See, sometime when God's ready to move, he ain't gonna let you see the whole thing. He just lets you see a little something, something to give you a taste. That's why the Bible says, oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. He may not give you the whole meal. He may just give you a sample plate. That means that the meal, sometimes God gives you an appetizer. He ain't ready to feed you the whole meal. He's just giving you a something, something so that you know what you have to look forward to. So he says, I, we only got a fist, but there's a shower. So watch this now. He tells Ahab, get in your chariot and go because this storm is going to get ready to break out. So get in your chariot and go. That means a horse is pulling the chariot. So he gets in a horse. He's got to go 15 miles from where he is to Jezreel. So Ahab gets in there and he's riding his horse. But I don't want you to miss the end of verse 46. Then the hand of the Lord was on Elijah and he girded up his loins and outran Ab Ahab to Jezreel. No, you didn't. Ahab is on a horse. Ahab is riding a horse. Oh, 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 Elijah picks up his cloak, ties it up, and he hoofs it. He hoofs it. And he outruns a horse to Jezreel. I believe Isaiah put it this way. They that wait upon the Lord will have new strength. They will mount up with wings like eagles. They will run and not get weary. They will walk and not faint. Somebody here ought to be willing to pray. Somebody here ought to be willing to cry out to God. Somebody here ought to be willing to touch heaven because the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much.